Okay, thanks. Yeah, so I'm, I'm Jim. I'm also representing a research institute called SIX, and we have a startup behind this. So I'm going to start by talking about our experience. We're running a data center in northern, northern Sweden. It's uh, actually located close to Facebook's data center, so we happen to get some of their uh, old machines. It's cheaper for them to give them to us than dispose them. But we're running um, Spark as a service, along with some other services like Hadoop and Flink and TensorFlow. And we're making it available to researchers and companies in Sweden for free. And we're building it on a, a new Hadoop distribution that we've developed at KDH called Hops Hadoop. Let's see where I'm going here. OK, we have about 130, 140 users at the moment. We're getting a bit of feedback on here. OK, sorry about that. So um, can you hear me, yeah? Yes? Thank you. OK. Right, so Hadoop, I'm going to talk firstly about our Hadoop distribution because we're building a lot of the concepts and a lot of the features in our platform based on this. And as you'll know, Hadoop is no longer the cool kid on the block, right? Um, you can build large-scale streaming infrastructures without Hadoop. Why do you need it in the loop? Um, really, if you think about Hadoop's evolution, it started out as this you know, nice elephant. And you, know, you might think that's MapReduce here in the middle. It's actually Diplodocus. So Diplodocus is uh, characterized by uh, its abnormally tiny brain. So its, um, its brain to, to body mass volume is, is, is extremely low. But what you can think about with Hadoop is that you know, there's not very much intelligence if, if the metadata that's supported in the architecture is extremely minimal. Um, so what people have been doing to help improve the amount of intelligence in, in the platform to make metadata available so that we have ground truth to reason about our jobs, to reason about our files, our data sets, is that they've been building out Hadoop with uh, a number of services. So you may be familiar with uh, a couple of the big Hadoop um, distributions, and they come with a number of these kind of uh, patchy projects for managing data governance, data provenance, uh, security. Um, and then we have even, thing, even things like Hive. So Hive is basically metadata around files in HDFS. Now, the thing about this is that the, the, the actual data is in this guy's brain down here, and then we have a copy of it out here, external, and you need to sync these things up, right? So you need to write some form of eventually consistent replication protocol to make sure that whatever's in here so that your, your file that your Hive table represents is actually still there when you're querying on the, the Metastore and Hive over here. Um, now, typically, they're not eventually consistent. They're not strongly eventually consistent because that's a really hard thing to do. It's very hard to program these types of systems. Um, and as a consequence, I kind of call this the Google Glass approach to intelligence. You're making the, the, the monster more intelligent by adding external services to make it more intelligent. So they're not inside internal to it. They're making it uh, outside. So what we've done is um, we've attacked the ground problem as we see it, which is that we need to make more metadata available in the platform, and we need to make it easier to use and easier to extend and add abstractions and, and, and new services. Uh, to Hadoop. So we, we have a platform called HopsFS. Hops is the, the distribution's name. And here's some of the performance uh, figures you can see. So we can, get, we can add name nodes. We can scale out this uh, metadata layer in the Hadoop file system. This is a drop-in replacement for the Hadoop file system, by the way. And then we can add uh, a lot more capacity with this uh, in-memory open source database that we're using at the back end. So we can have like at least 37 times the capacity of metadata, and we're getting at least 16 times the throughput of HDFS. Uh, by the way, this, these aren't you know, uh, vendor numbers. This is uh, peer-reviewed from a, like a tier one conference uh, using X here. So we're, you can see here that the amount of files that we can support and the, and the throughput of our cluster can be very high, but, and that will give us, that's what a larger brain will give you. It'll give you a faster, bigger uh, machine, but that's not necessarily what's interesting. So what we're more interested in is how do we make more intelligent uh, platforms? So that means can we introduce new concepts to make Hadoop and Spark Streaming and all the other frameworks on top easier to use? So what we've done is we've introduced a number of new concepts into Hadoop. And you can see the traditional Hadoop concepts on the left here. You have clusters. So people routinely talk about spinning up clusters at this conference. Uh, we don't. So our users will actually they'll just create what we call a new project. So a project is, you can think of it as being a cluster. It's a unit of isolation. You have data sets and files in it, Kafka topics, jobs, and notebooks you run. We don't, users don't have to deal with ACLs, sysadmins, no Kerberos. Uh, they don't need to worry about um, you know, giving access control, asking the sysadmin to do something to allow you to access your file. 
So these concepts we're, we're using now to build our, our platform on which we're providing Spark Streaming amongst other services. So I'll just briefly introduce Spark Streaming and some of the problems that we've seen in getting this uh, out in production. So firstly, we're running on Yarn. So we're not running on uh, the cloud, open cloud. This stuff does run on the public cloud, but we're running on, on a bare metal uh, Hadoop cluster, Hops Hadoop cluster. And Yarn has some limitations. So if you're running streaming jobs in Yarn, uh, the jobs, when they finish, they'll aggregate their logs. So you're not going to get logs of jobs as they're running. Um, you're going to need Kafka in there because pretty much all uh, Spark streaming applications are using Kafka. And uh, you're going to want to get some monitoring data about what's going on. So you want to observe, be able to look at the, the application properties and also your system properties. So if there's any problems, you'll be able to identify them and maybe support notification for that. So the platforms that we, we looked at and we, we picked to, to give us uh, these d different services were the Elk stack. Now, a lot of people here are also using um, you know, uh, different Apache pro uh, projects for doing uh, search, I think, like uh, Lucene and uh, uh, the other one that goes on top of it. I can't remember its name, but um, Solar, thank you. And um, you, you know, we looked as well at, at, at Prometheus, and, and there's some other open time series database for for storing your, your time series data, but we went with InfluxDB and Grafana. They're quite widely used. So there's a lot of options here out there for you. Um, so to, to, to start out with, we have a, a front end. We, it's a UI-driven platform that we're providing to our researchers and uh, companies, and this is kind of what it looks like here. But what you can see is that users, when they want to create topics in Kafka, they just prick, press the button and they enter uh, the name of the topic, and they can create it. If they want to, they can go down to the level of supplying uh, access control lists. Typically, you don't need to do that. Uh, the default model is quite, quite good for that. And you can share these topics, as I'll talk about later, between projects. Um, when you're doing logging, we're using Kibana to support logging. So as streaming jobs run, they'll write their logs typically to Logstash, and Logstash will then send them up to Elastic. And from Elastic, Kibana can then uh, you can see the logs in here, and you can filter them, and you can graph with them. So uh, if you want to look at your job in production and, and, and keep a, a view of, of uh, any, any maybe anomalies that are coming in terms of performance, if a streaming job has failed, you can use Grafana to do this. Um, an easy way to do this in, in uh, Spark is to supply something called a metrics.properties file. And in that file, you can then you can customize what you'd like to output to uh, InfluxDB. So the, the output will be written to InfluxDB, and Grafana will read from uh, InfluxDB to, to draw these graphs for you. So one of the useful properties is streaming metrics uh, dot streaming dot last received batch records. Uh, if that's zero for a while, you'll notice that your, your job may have failed. OK, one other thing that we find users are, are find uh, good for doing streaming apps is prototyping them. And you can do it in Zeppelin, right? So uh, that means Zeppelin is a notebook, if you're not familiar with it, kind of like Jupyter. Um, but it has good support for Scala, and uh, it integrates well in our platform. So in our case, these notebooks are actually stored in HDFS inside your project. So it's all nicely integrated there. One of the limitations of Ze Zeppelin in this case is that you know, if you saw the, Spar the Databricks demos, you'd like to just tape, take your notebook and turn it into a job. So that's currently not supported by Zeppelin, but I think it's on the roadmap, and when it's available, it'd be a pretty useful feature. So another tool that we provide that, that is not necessarily as relevant for streaming, but more relevant for batch, is um, a tool called Dr. Elephant developed by LinkedIn. So what it will do is it will take a, a Spark job after it's completed. It'll go to the Spark history server and also to the Yarn resource manager, and it will analyze your job. Because in, in Dr. Elephant, you supply a number of heuristics. Now, they have, a, I think, about 30 off-the-shelf heuristics, things like looking for out-of-memory errors and, and so on, uh, imbalance in your, in your keys and, and, and handling of your keys and things like that. But you can write your own ones if you want. Uh, there's a couple of points that uh, are against it for streaming. Obviously, it doesn't support streaming, so that's a, a big one. But you can still analyze jobs after they've finished. And if a job has been killed by yarn, uh, it just won't turn up at all. So that's kind of a, 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 a not-so-nice point. OK, so we have all these different services. And these are kind of support services that we, we felt, felt were necessary to allow users to actually run Spark Streaming. And what we want to do is pull them together. And we want to pull them together into a streaming as a service platform. 
So if you want to uh, uh, provide streaming as a service platform, you need to support multiple tenants, multiple users. Now, when I say multiple tenants, I mean users, not applications running on the same hardware. This is a project-based multi-tenancy in our case. So we're going to create projects with users, and they're all going to reside on the same platform, and they'll be security isolated from one another. If you're doing uh, streaming as a service, you'll need to do a self-service API or UI. So we have REST API, but also a user interface so that users can actually just launch their jobs, work with their data, and, uh, and Kafka, and things like that. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about how we uh, can radically simplify writing Spark streaming jobs in our platform, um, due, again, to these concepts that we've introduced into Hadoop. So we have this notion of what I call a project earlier on. And a project is basically a grouping of users and some sort of data input data channel. So typical data channels will be maybe a, a, a subtree in HDFS. It might be a topic in Kafka. Uh, you could support other data sources. We don't support that many other ones. Right now, those are the main two that we support. But if you take your data sources, and here we've got a data source here in blue, and a topic here, and another topic, another topic, and we have three users, a project is just going to be a grouping of those users. So we could take a, a grouping that looks like this. And we call it the project all. So here's where we have a company-wide database, and all the users are members of that project. And the data set that's in it is this uh, company DB. But then you, users can create their own projects. And the projects can be things like, for example, uh, project X here, which has these two members and these two data sources. And then we can have another project 42 here with these other two members and so on. So users are free to create projects. It's, it's what we call self-service. Users can go ahead, press buttons, create projects, invite people in. It's like GitHub, if you're familiar with GitHub, which most people are, I guess. So when you have a user in a project, you're gonna ha we have two, two main roles. So we tried to simplify this. Lots of people want lots of new roles, but we're, we try to keep it down to two to make it manageable. Um, so the two roles we ha have are inspired by the European legislation coming out later, uh, probably early next year, called GDPR, General Data Protection Regulation Law. We need to have a data owner, so somebody who's responsible for the data in that project. And that role, that person can import and export data to the project, manage membership, add users, change the role of users, share data sets or topics with other projects. And then we have another role called a data scientist who can just run code. You can upload jars as well, but uh, basically run code and do analysis of the, the data in place. So the, the difference between this and, and the traditional Hadoop platform is we don't have an administrator in the loop now. This is self-service administration. Users are free to create their own projects. Uh, one of the nice artifacts of this is that uh, if you take a, a company like Spotify, who we work with, who moved, uh, who've been moving to Google Cloud recently, they had a lot of orphan data sets and a lot of orphan products because they didn't know who, who was responsible for what data set and for what particular workflow. So in this case, it's quite clear. You have a clear, uh, clear line of, of ownership of, of both data and programs. So the projects themselves, uh, apart from having users and data sets, we support notebooks. We can share data sets between projects. And they also support quotas. So quotas in HDFS are pretty straightforward. They're supported by the file system. But we have a novel feature in Yarn that we call CPU quotas. So um, when you're running a Yarn application or a Spark application, Flink or MapReduce or whatever you're running, it's going to run on Yarn, and you'll get a price associated with it. And when your job completes, that will be decremented from your, your budget. So we give users a budget. Um, now, the, we're doing a kind of Uber, we're playing with an Uber style pricing model, like as the load on the cluster increases, the price goes up, and then as the load decreases, the price goes down. We want to try and balance out the load on the cluster over busy times. Uh, and it's working out quite well for the, for the most part. So users can launch jobs, time delayed jobs, like launch this at nighttime, which is what you would do on a, on a big job. Now, I mentioned already that, that we support projects as a unit of isolation. So that means that if you're a member of one project, and we have a user called Alice here who's a member of Project A, Alice can't copy data from Project A to Project B. All right? So Alice can't cross-link data from Project A to Project B. And this requirement came from bioinformatics, biomedical field, where they have clinical studies, and they just are not allowed to run a study or, or work with data where there's possibility of cross-linking with other data sources. So the way we implement it is with something called dynamic roles. Now, if you saw the keynotes this morning, uh, Ranger, Apache Ranger was introduced. That's an attribute-based access control system. 
Uh, this is a simpler version uh, which scales much better. There is no overhead in this model. In this model, we create a new user per project. So every project will have a different user in both HDFS and also in Kafka. So in HDFS and Yarn, the user is, is, is secure impersonation we're using as the mechanism for it, but in Kafka, we're using SSL certificates to identify the user. So there's no Kerberos in our system. We're doing everything with certificates. And uh, each project will have, uh, each user in a project will get a new certificate uh, issued for, for the user. This scales pretty well because you can have intermediate CAs for issuing certificates. And our front end can scale out, so it can be clustered. You can have as many instances as you want. Uh, the services themselves in the platform, like Spark, Namenode, Yarn, and so on, also have uh, a Kafka, also have certificates signed by the common uh, CA, so that they can now cross-authenticate with one another. So I said that we're going to try and simplify writing Spark streaming applications. If you've written Spark streaming application and you've used a lot of these services that I introduced already, you'll know that there's a lot of boilerplate work to do, right? So the kind of things you need to do is you might need to somehow manage your credentials for Hadoop. How do you talk to Kafka? Maybe you're using Kerberos, the Kerberos key tab. Um, maybe you're going to try and talk to a database like InfluxDB and you need credentials uh, and so on. Then you have a lot of endpoints you need to connect to. You need to connect to your Kafka broker. Where do you get the IP address for that? Maybe it ch might change. Maybe it's not going to be a static thing in your program. Um, you, you probably need a Kafka schema registry, so you need the endpoint for that, resource manager, name node, InfluxDB, all these services, you need to somehow get access to the, to the uh, information about them. So what we do is we hide all this complexity inside an API, and we make it transparent to the application. So what you end up needing to do is things like this, discovering your uh, endpoints, creating your properties file, creating your consumer properties and producer properties file, these are kind of developer level issues, but also the ops level issues of how do you get your certificates, send them out to the uh, nodes and do that secure, securely and clean them up. Uh, that's an ops level kind of issue. So we do all this in, in a couple of calls to an API. So if you're writing a producer that's just gonna produce to Kafka securely, you just need to write basically this line of code. Um, now it seems a little bit simple. You can, you can get, the topic we will see can come in um, because the user, when they're launching the job, can select the topic, and then if there's only a single topic, it'll be implicit here. But you can supply the topic explicitly if you want. The consumer, again, is, is, is going to be just as easy. So if you want, you can supply the topic in the program, or you can supply it when you're launching the job. Uh, consumer groups are optional if you want to use them, and then this is a, a streaming consumer. It can cons uh, consume directly. So how does this compare to the actual code you would write in a if you're writing just in a standalone Spark streaming app, you're gonna look something like this on the left, right? So we're, we're, this is secure uh, Spark streaming now. So we're gonna talk to Kafka, we're gonna use a certificate to talk to Kafka, and then we have to get all our endpoints. So there's quite a lot of code here, and we can just push that down to, to a single line. And you can read this, these examples in here in GitHub, so you, can, you can look on them later. So how do we do that? So you may be interested in say, okay, sounds interesting, but show me how it works. Well, the way it works is that when Alice wants to launch a job here, uh, she'll submit it to, to our, our, our uh, REST endpoint on, on Hopsworks for, through the UI, and it goes to this database. It's the same database, remember, that is storing all the metadata for the name node in HDFS and for Yarn, and we're using foreign keys to ensure the consistency and integrity of the data. So transactions are used when you mutate the data to ensure its integrity. Uh, the consistency of it, sorry, but to ensure its integrity, we use foreign keys. So if I have a project, the project will have user identities associated with it. It will have certificates associated with those users. All of these are stored in the database. And when you remove the project, the foreign key on delete cascade constraint will clean up everything for you. You don't need to write any code for that. So we get all our endpoints. Um, it kind of also acts like a, a registry for the microservices as well. So we can get our service endpoints from there. When we launch the Yarn job, we're also going to submit all this configuration information that we got from the database here uh, as environment variables. And then the other thing we need to do, and this is where Yarn is cool, right? This is where Yarn beats Mesos, and it beats running on native cloud. Yarn is like a, a you know, it's a rudimentary operating system, but it allows you to do things like copy files out to the, all the node managers. So typically it would be a jar file, but you can do it as a Yarn private local resource. It's gonna be private to your application. And we do that with the certificates. So we, we, we submit out the certificates as a Yarn private local resource. And 
when the application wants to just get a producer or a consumer, it calls that, and this hops util uh, library knows the environment variables that were gotten from here, it knows where the certificate is, it can read the certificate, and then you can talk, it also can talk back to uh, our uh, schema registry to get the schema for the topic, and then it can produce or consume to the topic in Kafka. Now, to bring all this back together, we, again, we want to make sure that the metadata is consistent, so the access control rules for topics in Kafka are, again, in our database. So when I, a, a Kafka gets an RPC to come in, it's going to look in the database to see if, you, if that user has permissions to, to execute that operation on that topic. Okay, so that, that's kind of the, the, the platform. So uh, we're working with a, a large IoT company, uh, and they're providing a platform to, a multi-tenant platform to a lot of users. And what they want to do is they want to take the sensor data in, they want to provide these services. Right now they just do ingestion, and they pass the data on to a number of customers. And we're working with them to get a, this platform in production for them. So it's not a, quite as simple as the first diagram showed because typically the customers run on different clouds and they don't want to leave their clouds, so the company has to deploy different cloud endpoints on the different cloud platforms. And then they have a number of servers that are connected to these uh, gateway devices down here at the bottom. These are the actual IoT devices down here, typically found in factories or on cruise ships or wherever. Uh, so the data flows up this way, and the customers access it typically using a, a mobile phone or a pad, an iPad. Now, one way you could do this on a, a cloud-native solution, so this is not the Hopsworks way, would be basically to take your, your data from all these collectors, push it into Kafka, and from Kafka have a streaming app right to, for example, uh, an S3 object uh, or Google Cloud Storage. And you can configure access control for those, uh, for those objects, and you can say, okay, this S3 bucket is just for, for this particular customer, and that will work fine, right? But each customer then needs to handle its own analytics and so on. But for the company in particular, what happens is they're, they're losing control now. The data that they're collecting and so on that they should extract value from, they're just giving it access directly to the customer. So what we're doing with Hopsworks with them is we're trying to create a, a more structured platform where they control the data, they keep the data, and then they can provide value-added services uh, on this multi-tenant uh, streaming platform. So the data is coming in through a, a Kafka topic we can see here on the left. And this is a project that the company runs. So we just have this pro one project. And each company will have their own project, and that project will have a shared uh, data set where we can stream the data to, and a shared topic where we can also stream the data to. And then we can generate value-added analytics reports based on the data. You can do it live or you can do it on, uh, offline on the data. And those reports, the companies then can decide to buy or not, and the companies can also decide to write their own Spark jobs if they want to. So our solution altogether looks like this. We have a Kafka talking to Spark streaming app, pushing into this project here. Uh, the data sets and topics, and then we have some uh, boilerplate analytics reports generated from that. Okay, so this platform as a whole, you can download it, it's all open source. We have automated installation support for it on, on a platform called Carmel and Chef. So it's just a few points and clicks and it'll install on EC2. I'm gonna do a quick demo just to show you how this works. I think I have time. So let's show you how we do that example. So here, here's the front end, I'm gonna log in. Um, I've logged in here onto one, and I'm going to log into another one here. So I'm logged in as two separate users now. So this is me up here. You can see all the picture of me up there. And this is the admin up here. So a project is like a kind of GitHub project here, so I can call this one, let's call it Spark P. And I just, so that, that created a subtree in HDFS and an, a bunch of new users, and it went very quickly. By the way, this is running on my laptop, in case you're uh, wondering, just on a virtual machine. So when I clicked on the project, I go inside the project here. So what we can do is we can go to Kafka. And I had a schema already here, so this schema already exists. You can just add schemas there and update them. And I'm going to create a topic name. We'll call it, uh, I called it Donald already. We'll call this one Obama, just for whatever, because he's nice. Um, OK. So there's a, a quick topic called Obama. Um, so what, I, what I'd like to do now is just create a data set and upload my program there. We're going to call it my uh, program. I always call it the program. It's a great name. So you can see it's pretty quick because the metadata is all in, in HDFS. It creates a readme by default. I'm just going to delete that one. We'll upload a new one. 
Um, where am I? I'm in the wrong folder. There we go. So I'm just uplo uploading a program there. Um, okay, so that's, that's this data set here. You can see it's called program. We can do visualizations of them. There's Obama there. You can see him. That's not a cigarette, in case you're interested. Um, okay, so we can now run that job, but what I haven't done is I haven't uh, gone to my other user. So I'm going to go back to my other user. We're going to call this uh, Spark C for Spark Consumer. So I've just created another project called Spark C here, and I'm going to share the data set with uh, Spark C. So I'm going to share this program just so that the other user doesn't need to. They're both going to run the same program, okay? So one's going to run as producer, and the other one's going to run it as consumer. So now I'm back at the consumer, and I'm just going to uh, look for that data set. It, it appeared down here. And I need to actually accept it, because I didn't ask for it. So you can see it appears in here, and I have the same data in here. That's not co none of this is copying data, by the way, in case you're, you're curious. So the next thing I have to do is actually share my uh, new topic with the project. And I can do it like this. And now let's define the, the job and start running. OK. So we'll call this one producer S. And it's a Spark job. And I can select the program. So the program is just a jar file. And uh, you can see we, we actually added into the, uh, the class path that was picked out already from, the, uh, from inside the jar. And we need one, so this program runs as both producer and consumer. So to run it producer, I just add the producer argument. And then I need to create it. So this is yarn. These are yarn parameters here. You can do dynamic executors if you're running on, um, yeah, if you're running batch jobs, it's quite useful. But uh, in this case, I'm going to, you see, I'm selecting the Kafka topic. Now you might think, okay, why don't you do that in your program? But one of the nice features we find is that you know, if you're using a shared topic and you forgot to share it with someone, the fact that they have to select it here will pick up that error early if it hasn't been shared with you. So I've created this job here. I'm just going to start it running. It's a producer. Um, the price is currently 1x, and I'm OK with that. So it's going to launch it on Yarn. And um, I'll, I'll let that run. It'll take a couple of seconds to run. So it says it's accepted. Yarn, yarn jobs take a few seconds to kick off. They go into accepted, and now it's running. Uh, we can go to the UI to see what's happening. And this is actually uh, the, there's a Spark UI. Uh, we have a bunch of UIs. So we have Yarn UI. And then I mentioned earlier on we have Kibana. And um, there's Kibana. And you can see it's pulling some data out already. And then we have metrics here as well. So this is the uh, Grafana. So this is actually a producer, so not much is happening in Grafana. So I'll just go back and give you an idea of what you can do with um, Kibana. So if you're with Kibana, you can like look at the ratio of your info to warn messages, and that's quite nice. Um, but we'll go back and have a look at our consumer. So this is our consumer here. The consumer wants to consume from that shared topic. So I'm going to just write the job to do that. Uh, we call it consumer p. And I'll select the same jar file. And this is the same, it's actually the same jar file as the other one. Now in this case, I need to actually run. Uh, I need to pass in consumer as an option. I'm going to write the output to HDFS. So I'm just going to put in the path directly. Uh, it's Spark C. And we have, we have a resources folder or data set which is created automatically. So I'm going to write in there and to a file called data. OK, so again, I need to, I'm going to select the topic. Um, you can see that almost a compilation step, and I'll create the job for that. OK, so this is our consumer is being created. I can run the consumer now. Price has gone up a little bit because my VM doesn't have much resources. And uh, the consumer will start running now. So what we have is the producer here, which is a different project and a different user, uh, writing to a topic. It's a Spark program. And then we have a Spark streaming consumer here reading from it. So if I look at the output of the Spark streaming, you can see we can look at the streaming tab here. And you can get some nice stats on your jobs in the, in the streaming tab. OK, so we can see that there's a bit of data coming in. There's not really any processing delay, a couple of seconds. This isn't doing very much, by the way, in case you're wondering this job. It's just reading data every, every second uh, and writing to a file and overriding it in HDFS. Um, we can look at the logs in Kibana. And then the metrics, we can have a little, little bit more of a look at here. You can see that it's, um, it's running a bunch of tasks. We've got some HDFS stats here. 
uh, reads and writes, and then you've got some JVM stats down here. So this is configurable with your metrics.properties file. So if you then proceed to say I want to stop this, what it's going to do, it's going to do a graceful shutdown, because you have to do that in Yarn. So it's going to uh, take away a file. Called, we have a marker file, and um, you just rem it's going to remove it from a folder, and uh, then you're done. OK, so that's, that's the demo. Um, so where are we with our platform? Well, we have a lot of things in our roadmap. We're working on things like multi-data center for the file system. Uh, we have a really nice solution for small files. To, we have erasure coding support already, and we're doing two-level erasure uh, coding. We're doing a lot of work in Yarn, Yarn and TensorFlow, and we have uh, a way of sharing these data sets between clusters with peer-to-peer. -peer. And then we'd like to get Jupyter and Presto and Hive in here as well. OK, so just to summarize, this is a new distribution of Hadoop. It's called uh, Hops. We provide first-class support for Spark streaming, and um, we do that with the help of all these services like Kafka, Elk Stack, Zeppelin, uh, and Grafana and InfluxDB. A lot of people have worked on this platform. Um, you can see a bunch of organizations here. Uh, so they're the people to thank for this. And um, I'd like to conclude by thanking you and saying that you know we understand it's going to be Spark streaming first, but please take a chance to say uh, Hopsworth second. Okay, thank you. <laughs>